Hello everyone and welcome to my presentation today on low back pain and sciatica. Um, this can be a, um, a confusing and overbearing uh, conversation to have. So my aim is to have it as simple as possible for you all. Um, so that way we can um, have a good foundation and move forward. Now, if, if I pause, it's just because I'm um, allowing people into the chat today. So um, yeah, apologies as I'm navigating that. Okay, so what qualifies me to talk to you today about low back pain? Um, I'm a graduate from Melbourne University, 13 years in private practice, completely in private practice, strong background in private physio um, clinics and in sports physiotherapy, um, was working for a number of years with a, a strong local provider um, before starting up my uh, own location with a, a growing team across West Melbourne and the Masson Ranges. Um, my primary focus is on chronic disease management, despite my sports background. It's a big passion of mine. Uh, personal goal is to be forever young. So um, a lot of the conditions that we're talking about today um, and the perspective that I'll share with you, um, I hope will help arm you in your own um, decision making in, in ensuring that you have great lifelong health. Okay, now. I'm going to be addressing a few terms today that you may have seen in MRI scans and CT scans and x-rays. And with back pain and sciatica, um, we'll be focusing mostly on that today, but I think it's important to address some of these common terms and just remove a lot of the question marks around them. Terms like osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, um, a fancy word called spondylolisthesis. That's a tongue twister. Um, and what that is and what that may mean for you, plus a few other conditions here, general stiffness, posture pain, movement problems, nerve impingement, um, slip discs, a, lo a lot of these lay terms, we'd like to remove the mystery um, so that it can help you with your own management. And the list can go on. Now, where I'd like to start and what we will do is circle back to this theme is of spectrums, okay? I like that there is a spectrum and we all live somewhere on this spectrum. Now, in this particular guideline of the health spectrum, if we have on one extreme sickness and on the opposite end of the extreme, we have wellness, I'd like to think we all sit somewhere here on this health spectrum, regardless of your age, your sex, whatever your comorbidities are, whether you are diagnosed with cancer, you know, yes, you may argue you're on the sickness end of the health spectrum, but your goal, regardless of that, is to head towards being healthier, improving your health. If you have been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, you may argue that that person is healthier than the person that's managing cancer. But despite that, the common theme is improving your health and so on and so forth. So this spectrum that I'm introducing is something that I'll come back to, but I'll introduce it um, also with other themes within this presentation of low back pain. Okay, so... Um, just keep that in the back of your mind. Now, spine 101 is where I'd like to start. And if you put your x-ray goggles on and you look into the body, you can see that there's a normal curvature to your spine. There's seven levels of your neck spine, your cervical spine. There's 12 for your mid-back, your thoracic spine. And we're focusing downstairs here, your lumbar spine, of which there's five bony segments. Okay, there's five levels of bone. And at each of these levels, it's cushioned by this disc, which is very malleable. That disc is very jelly-like in substance. Okay, and then you have these thick wedge-like bones. And then you've got this tunnel, which houses your spinal cord, which connects your brain to the body. And then at each level, there's holes or foramen where your nerve jumps out at different levels of your spine. Okay, very important, and we'll come back to why this is important for sciatica. Now, the three components of the spine that I'll be addressing at length today is your muscles, your discs and nerves, which I've uh, compartment, um, put them in a compartment together, and your bones. Okay, so that's an overview of your lumbar spine. Now, stage number one, muscles. Remember that your spine is quite a deeply set structure within the body. So starting outside in, we have these external muscles that play a really important part in your lower back pain slash health. 
Now you've got all sorts of muscles here. I'm not going to test you so you don't have to memorize them all. But all these muscles, these ropes, play an external um, support system for your body. Okay? Now, we also have muscles inside your body. Okay? And they are part of your core muscles. Again, you don't have to memorize the names, but just be mindful that if you put your x-ray goggles on, there's some key muscles that pertain to your internal spinal health. Some of them help you breathe your diaphragm. Others provide like a glad wrap consistency, which is very much a strong focus of Pilates, transversus abdominis. Some Move the chair back a bit. Altifidus. Marie Gunan, I just need you to reach your uh, microphone. Move over a bit. Sorry, I thought I'd mastered this by now. Apologies, guys. Okay, and then you have other key muscles uh, pertaining to, to men's and women's health, your pelvic floor. Okay, so external muscles, internal muscles. And I'd like you to also consider your backside and your leg muscles. Okay, all of these guys provide active support for your spine. So this is just one potential area that may go wrong, which is part of the um, builds the momentum in further down the line, developing your back pain, okay? So that's why I'm starting with the active support of these muscles. Now, the best way I could think about um, demonstrating this in terms of a metaphor is if you think of an egg, okay? The outer shell I'm putting as your external muscles, okay? Now, if they're not as strong as what they should be, it could be fragile and you can break the outer shell, putting the whole structure, your spine under risk. Now, if we think of the yolk in this paradigm as your internal muscles, well, if the insides aren't so well, the, the egg yolk isn't too flash. It's not something that you would provide you a lot of good nutrition, okay? So, um, and, and the egg holder is your pelvic girdle, your, your lower limb muscles, which give you a lot of power. If you bend, you lift, you walk, well, to some degree pushing and pulling, you need a strong foundation. And that is like your, our egg holder in this case, and all these muscles perform a role in supporting your spine. Okay, I'm keeping it really simple here as we're, we're having a, an overview of muscles, because ideally I'm going to be focusing on the disc and nerve. Now, if you're having problems with your muscles, how does this affect your back? Well, you can have issues like local back stiffness. You can have issues where if your hamstring isn't firing as well as it should, it can actually refer pain to your lower back. Uh, last week, I spoke about postural issues. So if muscles aren't as strong as they should be, the load is going to be displaced elsewhere. So postural balance, if you find uh, your balance is getting quite poor, like if you're putting on your pants, as you slip one leg into your, your pants, uh, your, your balance will be a bit um, more suspect on one leg compared to the other. And reduced strength, injuries like a muscle tear or repetitive tasks. So these common signs you may see is a, is, is a reason why you may be um, building towards your back pain issues. Okay, now I introduced the spectrum earlier. So if you look at this spectrum at an acute issue from a muscle perspective, so common muscle conditions, so an acute versus chronic, if you have a very no, acute injury, if you, um, you strained a muscle, or if, uh, sorry, I'm just going to try and find somebody here that's struggled to mute. There we go. Okay. Excuse, sorry, guys, give me one second. Thanks, guys. I'd appreciate it if you could please just pop yourself on mute. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, so on a spectrum here of muscle injuries, if you had an acute problem, so you overstrained yourself bending to lift something or you had a fall, uh, you could have a tear okay, of a muscle. It's an acute problem. If you had some bruising or if you're developing this pain over a longer period of time, you can start to have issues with your posture or you start to develop tightness over time with muscle issues as it becomes a chronic issue. You, de you develop reduced strength. So your global conditioning reduces over time. Now, I'm going to come back and marry this up at the very end, but think for yourself where you may sit in terms of your muscle conditioning 
on this health spectrum uh, in terms of your muscles rather. Okay, now moving to bones here, if we think of the anatomy of bones, they're almost like inanimate objects. They are providing anchor points for the active structures, which are your muscles. So they come in and they anchor onto these levers and they help move those levers around. Now, as an example, we've got a picture here of a healthy spine, nice space between the joints, and then you have an osteoarthritic sign, uh, spine where there's a lot less uh, water volume, reduced joint space. You can see instead of being nice and smooth, a bit more jagged, narrow space, and then just starts to get compressed. Now, you may have observed um, some results on a recent x-ray or imaging, and you may have heard of these, you may have read these um, other conditions. And not to labor this point, but all I'm addressing here is you could have muscle conditions that pertains to your back injury. I'm just presenting now bony conditions that can also give you back pain. So one of these common ones is called a spondylosis, which is a fancy way of saying there's a mild break or a pars defect of a key bone structure within your lower back spine. And if that worsens over time, then instead of being a mild break, it completely fractures and you start to get this forward or anterior slippage of the spine level above relative to the one below it. Now that sounds really scary, but this could be a stable slippage, which a lot of the things that I'll speak about can still be addressed conservatively. So you'd be amazed to hear that this type of bony fracture does not often mean surgery. It's well within the scope of conservative strengthening work. So that's good news. So if you observe any of these um, terms within your scans, um, they usually point to a bone problem, okay? Key point. Now, if I come back to this spectrum, again, in terms of common bone conditions, if we're looking at acute or mechanical problems, and at the other end of the spectrum, you have a chronic long-term issue or an inflammatory problem, in terms of your bone health, um, an acute nasty problem is if you break your bone, so fractures are not very friendly, but very painful and obviously quite acute. You could have a bony, uh, bony contusion, so a bruised ankle. You could pancake on your backside and you've got a bruised sacrum or, or coccyx bone, very common. Um, over time, let's say weeks and months, even into years, that bone condition deconditions more so and you, be, you develop osteoarthritis which we spoke about in the GLAD program earlier. Uh, and then you can start to develop those uh, mild fractures uh, in your spine, which is called a pars defect. And then over time, you can start to develop metabolic conditions, um, which present in your bones like rheumatoid arthritis and ankylosing spondylosis. So I just wanted to put all these, it's like you're trying to arrange all these different pieces into pigeonholes so that you can understand where you sit on your own health spectrum. So I'll come back and put this all together, but okay, now you've understood your muscle spectrum. How well are you conditioned? Now we're looking at the health of your bones and you're thinking about your own personal um, profile here. Now, this is where we're gonna spend a lot of our time, the disc slash nerves, the key player. Now, what you can see, which I mentioned earlier, the anatomy of your spine um, you have ligaments that sit across the back of your spine here, which we won't um, focus on too much at the moment. We're really focused on the anatomy of the disc. Now, if I pull the bones apart, you can see that the disc is um, this kind of U-shaped structure, and there's a fibrous exterior. Think of layers and layers of glad wrap, and inside the glad wrap is the jelly. That's where the malleability comes about. Now, if you have this rigid inan inanimate object like your bones and there's segments of bones, the maneuverability comes from the discs at each level of your spine, okay? So by grand design, the discs allow movement, like the, the, the rotation components and the muscles are the pulleys that help move you about. So that's why I'm trying to um, segment all the different players here. Now in the disc, if we can understand that the disc is jelly-like in substance, if I bend to the right side, the bones will squash the right side of the jelly, forcing the disc to the left. 
If I bend to the left, the bones will squash the left side of the jelly, forcing it to the right. Now, in our current environments, and I'll speak on this some more shortly, we are always mostly in a forward sitting position at 90 degrees. So we are chronically squashing the front of the disc, plus or minus bending, lifting, pushing, pulling within our own normal daily lives. So if this um, malleable structure is being pushed into one direction over time, imagine this jelly within the fibrous glad wrap, if the jelly is being pushed in the same direction over and over, it weakens, the, it puts pressure on the wall and the wall can weaken. And that's when you start to develop trouble. And what does that trouble mean? These are the common words that you may see in your scans. Disc herniation, disc prolapse, desiccated, which means, um, you know, the cheese, the, the French cheese, that's holy. That's, that's what desiccated means. Bulging disc, slip disc, sciatica, referred pain. All these terms are a measurement of how much of a disc bulge there may be. Now, when I was laboring this point about the jelly-like structure of the disc, okay, if you can imagine yourself bending forward, sitting for long periods of the day, you are pinching and compressing the front part of the disc, forcing the jelly backwards. And then the poor fibrous glad wrap just just runs out of, of, of durability and then that's when you start to bulge and if it takes up the space of what's behind the disc that's where this happy nerve is and it impinges on the nerve okay so you can see here nice and happy unhappy and then what happens is the nerve starts to send um, abnormal information now as an overview all I'd like to present here is that at each level of your spine, which we spoke about earlier, they supply different parts of the body. Now we call this referred pain where there's an issue centrally being referred per uh, peripherally away from the body. So that's why you may have issues in and down the leg, which I'll talk about in a moment. And I, uh, what this picture just shows is the distribution of these nerves and the potential of where you could be feeling this referred pain. Now, if we think about nerves, what do they do? A lot of things, but at a, a big level, they supply your skin. So nerve supply skin gives you feeling and sensation. They also supply your muscles, which give you strength. Now, if in your scan, or if you're finding that there's weird signs referring down, down your leg, what happens here is those five levels of your lower back give you a distribution of on your skin, sensation wise, on where that nerve supplies. So if you have a problem, say a pinched nerve, so you have a nerve impingement at level L4, this nerve here at L4 is going to be unhappy. So L4, you can see, can refer around the belt line from your back and that swings around to the front of the leg and often down into your foot. So this referred pain pattern in terms of sensation and feeling, pins and needles down the leg, we would test for whether this is the level that's unhappy in your lower back in terms of, so maybe you have less touch and feel. So sharp and soft objects are hard to differentiate. Those are the sorts of tests we would conduct. Now, in terms of muscles, the nerves, as I said before, supply muscles. So for that, I'm sorry, this is a bit hard to see here, but you'll have to take my word for it. L4 nerve supplies some of your leg muscles. So if you're finding that you're walking, um, your, your balance, your strength is starting to go wayward, um, it may be because of an issue in your back, not so much the leg. Um, what's often common with low back pain and referred leg pain is foot drop. So that level L5, you can see in this light orange, goes right down to your foot and it powers these key muscles that help bring your foot, your, your toe up off the ground and clears the ground as you walk. Now, if that muscle is not very strong, that foot drop can affect your gait pattern. Okay, so in common theme with the muscle spectrum here, the bone spectrum, now you're going to be thinking about 
your own disc condition. So if you think about your average day, acutely, do you find you can tolerate sitting for say 30 minutes before you start to develop localized aching around your lower back? Or maybe it takes a couple of hours of working away for work that you start to find there's quite an irritation, especially when you go from sitting for an hour to standing. Okay, moving a long time, maybe a couple of weeks, months along, you've been burying your head in the sand or very busy, maybe you have young children or your work is quite manual, you may start to develop this stooped posture. Like first thing in the morning, when you get out of bed, you might find you're very stiff and creaky in the morning. It takes a couple of minutes to get going before your back alleviates. Okay, you may have um, more, more of a deconditioning issue which overloads your disc, starts to get unhappy. And over the course of time, you can start to develop preferred leg pain and significant disc and joint wear and tear degeneration. So have a think on what your body is trying to tell you. Where do you sit on your disc health spectrum? Now, this looks like an innocent graph and no one likes to be back at, at school and, and looking at graphs, but I would say this is the most important slide of this presentation. Now it looks pretty innocent because in red is your, is your load. So it's how much your body can absorb. And then this green horizontal line is your tolerance, AKA your strength. Now you can see here that there's a breach of where the load passes your tolerance level, your strength. And that is where you have a highest risk of injury. Okay, so what your body can tolerate, how much your body has in terms of petrol in the tank in strength. Now I'm gonna come back to this for each of these conditions. So if we think about something acute, let's say you tore a muscle, because this is a muscle predictor graph. If you start to overstretch the muscle, you're playing football and you overstretch the muscle, okay, it'll go to a point where you're overstretching the tolerance of the muscle and then it tears, okay, that's a problem. Over the time horizon, let's say over weeks turns into months, your tolerance, your strength will start to go from say this level and let's say it drops down to this level, halfway down. So you will find that for the things that you were doing, like just sitting, bending, lifting, shopping, your tolerance will start to be reduced because you're not as strong. So it takes less load before you start to run out of petrol. Okay, this is, this is the best graph I can use to help demonstrate that your muscle tissue only has a certain amount of load it can tolerate before it starts to let you down. Now, if you're chronically weak and you're at the other end of your muscle health spectrum, so very, very weak, a lot of overload, imagine your tolerance is very, very minimal. It's right down the bottom here. So you may observe over the course of time, things that you did five years ago, you feel within yourself you're the same person, but you do that same thing now compared to five years ago, I'd submit to you it's because your tolerance is less, i.e. your strength is less. So your muscles, your poor muscles can't handle that load. And then it starts to deflect the load elsewhere, which is what I'm going to build towards. So I'd like to challenge you to think about again, where you sit on the muscle spectrum. Same thing with bone spectrum. Now, again, there's only so much the bones can tolerate. So if you had a heavy fall, it was more load than what your body could tolerate and absorb, fracture, okay? If you copped a blunt uh, blow, then bruising, contusion. Over time, less conditioning, tolerance, that horizontal green line gets lower and lower, start to develop more and more deconditioning. Now, here's the thing that pertains to disc problems. If your muscle and bone tolerance, that horizontal green line gets less and less and less, okay? it will increase the problem of your disc pain, which is what we're going to be addressing today. So that you have a higher chance of developing the scary disc injury. Now, what happens is if the muscular component of your, your spine, the muscles, the, the active component of your spine, the muscles are weak, so the weakness here, if we layer in on top of that, the load, how much, how busy you are, how much you're doing, how often you're bending, pushing, pulling, lifting, sitting, it's all load. Even though you're resting and sitting, the spine takes that load still. And if your tolerance line is really depressed, it's, you're not as strong as you should be, 
the act of sitting for too long can overload your disc, hence the unhappy emoji. So in terms of, again, the same graph applied to disc conditions, this is how we can disseminate between your condition to somebody else because we all live somewhere on your own health spectrum. And so again, if you don't have the muscle uh, strength, you don't have the durability of these bones, the passive structure, which is your disc, which is just this jelly that cushions between bones, they start to absorb all this load. And you start to quickly find that your bone and disc pain starts to quickly degenerate. So again, revisiting first principles, the disc is a jelly-like substance, very easy to move and maneuver. And when you are starting to create problems in the disc, it does bulge and it can impinge on the nerve and send referred pain. Now, there's a quick test here that we can apply for yourselves if you're well enough at home. And these tests are very simple and we apply this in the physio clinic every day. And what it tells us is to your specific intolerances. This is one of many tests. Now, as you've heard, there's plenty of structures around your body in terms of muscles. There's plenty of things in terms of your bones, and then there's your disc and nerves. So there's a lot of structures here that can all give you pain signals. And how do we know where we should allot our energies, our efforts to improve our back health? Okay. Well, if you're standing upright and you have your hands on your hips and you slowly bend forward and it's painful, it would tell us that you have a flexion or forward bending intolerance. And that would tell me that there are some structures in your spine that's going to be more unhappy compared to other structures. Okay, so it narrows down my field of search. So if you're trying this for yourself, try a forward bend and that takes away a third of the work because we know that there's Anything that allows you to bend forward may be those things that we should test further and highlight upon. If you do the opposite movement where you're standing upright and you have your hands on your hips bending backwards, you have an extension or a backward intolerance. And again, it gives us more information on what may be causing you problems. The most challenging one is something called compression, where kind of like the, the shearing force is side to side or the up and down compression force. Um, and the best way to uh, ascertain the health of, of, of your body or your lower back with this test is if you're pushing your belly out as you're walking. So when I say pushing your belly out, it's like you're bracing for impact if someone's about to punch you in the tummy. So if you're standing, got my hands on my belly, just the edges of my belly button, and I'm pushing my tummy out against my fingers, and then I'm starting to walk, bracing as I'm bracing as I'm breathing, and that rep reproduces your back pain, then that tells me as your professional that, okay, there's some structures that don't like compression in your back. So this may be a good self-test, self-diagnostic that can help you in the best way to graduate an exercise program. And I'll give you some tangible things you can do right now today to help you with your back pain um, towards the end of this presentation. So um, yes, look forward to that. Now, I'm bringing this all together now because I'd like to challenge you to think about where you are on your muscle spectrum, your bone spectrum, and now your disc here. Because for each of the spinal load versus tolerance graph, for each of these different um, uh, structures, we also want to understand how it plays into each other, plus a missing piece that I'd like to reintroduce, which is your health spectrum, because I know there's a lot of arrows and diagrams here, but how this works for you is, is if you are somebody that uh, has an acute injury, say a muscle, and everything else in terms of disc and bone is quite minor, the advice and expertise we would give you would vary to somebody else like an older Australian who has um, more significant issues. So the advice in the assessment would be completely different. And this is why I've spent so much time framing up these different uh, segments of your back pain, because we're looking at this classically as one problem. So let's say one problem is a muscle injury, which can give you back pain. That's not often the case. Usually there's three or four problems 
intermixed all together and lay it on top of that, maybe also a chronic disease that you're concurrently managing. So yes, you may have a disc problem in your back. You may have some osteoarthritis, but you may be also managing type two diabetes. And that's a significant um, challenge to manage um, at, at a single sort of level, but the complexity comes in when there's layers to your back pain. Now, I've got a tangible example here. So imagine you're a 35 year old woman with a three month history of low back pain. You may have a couple of kids, you may be working part time. Um, that's the, the background of this particular case study. Now, if you look at the muscle example, I'm, I'm suggesting that she's probably been doing it tough, um, breastfeeding or um, you know, keeping on top of her, her house, housework. She may be also um, doing some group training fitness program. So she may not have the best conditioning as what she would like. So I've kind of placed it here on her muscle spectrum. In terms of her bones, she's still quite young, fit and healthy. So she doesn't have a fracture, but she has um, a healthy bone profile. Then we look at her disc because she's complaining of referred pain down the leg. Okay, I would probably suggest that um, she has a certain back pain that is more muscle related. Okay, and because of the muscle weakness, she started to overload the disc a bit unhappy. And in terms of her health profile, she may be just looking to try and shed a few kilos there and, and improve her health. Compared to a 62 year old man with type two diabetes and is overweight, if we look at their profiles here, in terms of muscle, he may be quite deconditioned, globally weak. If we look at the bone profile, he may be also managing that bone slippage that I was talking about, the spondylolisthesis, and he also may be managing the severe disc and joint degeneration. And if you look at his own personal health spectrum, okay, he also is managing type 2 diabetes. So the advice in the assessment of a 62-year-old bloke with some chronic disease conditions compared to a 35-year-old lady is very different, which is what I'm going to be stressing to you today. So again, if you think about your own personal situation, where do you sit on your individual profiles? So where I'd like to come back to, something is better than nothing. Absolutely. Being active allows your disc health to be optimally happy because that stasis, that prolonged sitting, that repetitive forward bending, it starts to create problems at the disc level. And as you've learned, over time with muscle weakness can start to develop the referred pain and the sciatica that you've come to learn. So apart from reducing the chance of disc pain um, and ongoing low back pain, they also have metabolic um, benefits too, like um, helping you with blood pressure, cholesterol, your physical fitness. And as you've learned with the GLAD program, helps you with your cartilage health so that your knee joint, hip joint are quite happy. So helps you with your mood, helps you with your mental health. Being active is always our number one prescription, which we can toggle up and down depending on your individual um, lifestyle. So number one recommendation, you're here for things that you can apply in your lives today. Um, and I'll give that to you absolutely. Now, the recommendation I give really comes down to an appropriate assessment. Now, I know it can be underwhelming, but I will give you one or two key exercises that I give, okay? But I'm really emphasizing the reason why I threw so many like um, arrows and graphs at you is because if you ask a allied health professional, uh, you know, I've got back pain, please help. You'll also, you'll, you'll almost see physios almost stare off into the horizon because we're internally calculating all the potential triggers of what may be causing your back pain. And that's why specifically for low back pain and with referred sciatica pain, um, the assessment of your body, the Q's and A's is really important because we need to know your specific condition, your specific environment. Okay, so in Australia, the Australian Physio Association, um, having great people around you, your local physio provider um, can help you with the assessment for your specific game plan. So yes, easy question, difficult answer, because this is what I revert to, because I, I'm trying to give you the best help, because essentially we want to help you, we don't want to make you worse. Okay, we take in consideration your muscle conditioning, your bone health, the happiness of your disc and the nerve, 
And where are you on the health spectrum? You know, are you, are you carrying a little bit more weight? Do you have, you know, serious chronic conditions that you're co-managing with, with medications as well? So we just want to make sure we do the right thing by you with a proper assessment. So in terms of global um, advice that I give for back pain, reduce the aggravating factors. Now, this is an underdone uh, bit of advice because the things that we do, as you've come to learn, puts load on the body. And when you don't have the conditioning, aka tolerance, then you start to develop problems. And the first place that you develop problems is with the inflammatory response. So you will find aching and throbbing in your back, or you may find that your night pain, it throbs like a toothache at nighttime. So if you're reducing things like simply trying to avoid sitting for long periods of the day, and if you cap your sitting at say half an hour with regular stand up rests, um, that's a very good place to start. Okay, reducing your load, um, marries up to reducing your aggravating factors. So if you are training in the gym, if you're running, if you enjoy walking, if you're doing things that's new, which is great, it's exciting, but it's a bit more than what your body can tolerate, then you may increase the risk of injury. So having specific loads, really important. Now I'm going to give you two specific exercises that you can start today with no equipment. And they are the exercises that I give every day in the clinic, but specific Specificity is really important because as you've learned with the graphs and the arrows, you need something that is crafted for you. You know that frustrating scenario that you may be in when, you know, someone tells you that, oh, you know, I went and saw this person, he helped me out and he gave me these exercises or he told me to do this. And then you try that same bit of advice on your particular pain problem and it doesn't make you any better. Or in fact, it might make you worse. That frustration you have is because you're a different person from your friend or family. Different circumstances, different load tolerances, um, different load tolerances, yes. And you know that exercise for your friend was crafted for their specific problem. So I share your frustration when you want the quick fix, it's human nature, but the reality is we all put our bodies through different loads in how we choose our lives. So the specificity of your homework, the correction work is really important. Now, once you've built that foundation, you can then increase your strength and it opens up more doors. You have more bandwidth to do what you like. You've earned the right to you know, be more excited with the things you choose to do, but only once you've addressed your aggravating factors, managing your load and done specific work, then you can start to explore new horizons. Okay, and then from there, you slowly increase and return back to your desired activities. And if you need that specific help, make a time to see your local professional. Okay, now before I go through an example here, um, I just wanna to touch on MRI scans. Now, we value, as physiotherapists, as medical health providers, we value MRIs, CT scans, X-rays um, as a form of assessment. So what does that mean? If you have um, a piece of paper that tells you that you have a disc bulge, that is great information for us to use to form a diagnosis. But it doesn't, that, that um, report on the x-ray has a bit of finality to it, but it helps us in, in helping us craft your best management plan. Because as you'll come to see, you know, we don't want you to fear the disc bulge because it is part and parcel of our aging process. And what we want to try and do is build your resilience, build your tolerance, because that disc prolapse can be managed conservatively. It doesn't automatically mean onward referral to escalate your management plan. Okay, now this scientific paper, um, which is very recent, 2015, a systematic review is basically a top-notch classification on scientific uh, evidence-based research. And what they found was for people under 50 years old who complained of back pain, an MRI scan found that, yes, it marries up to a disc or joint problem that we've walked through, and it was identified on the MRI scan. So it basically told them what they knew. And why this is important is because we would be treating, if we assessed you and the physio found that, okay, your signs suggest that you have a disc problem, we would manage you 
in, in that fashion. So the imaging would only confirm how we would continue to manage anyway for your disc injury. Now, I hope that, that paints that picture clear because in this same research, they also found that um, people are walking around with asymptomatic signs so they have no back pain, but then an MRI scan of that asymptomatic individual found that they had a disc bulge at multiple levels across their back, but they weren't symptomatic. They had not reported any pain. So I guess I'm trying to present two sides of the same coin here. What's important is that if you get an extra, uh, a scan and it says you have a disc bulge, I think it's great information that you're gathering, but persist on with your management plan. It forms part of the assessment, but we don't use that as your formal diagnosis. Now, what I'm going to do is share my screen and I'd like to play the short video of a lumbar disc bulge of a, um, a, a leading physio provider, a professional in Australia, Dr. Andrew Locke. And uh, I hope you can hear this audio. No audio, Lecky. No audio. Oh, bugger. No. Okay. Um, let me. Let me. Same system. Let me try this. Okay. Take <clears throat> Still no audio. Still no audio. Oh my gosh. Okay. I will, um, can you hear me still? I yeah, can hear yes. you. Okay. Yes. Sorry about that. I'll, I'll go through the, I'll pretend to be the audio. <laughs> okay. So um, let me restart this. Okay. So in this video, we have the MRI scan of the same person three months apart. Now, in here, you can see there's a disc extrusion, so a significant disc bulge, and in white is your spinal cord. This is L, it looks like L5. And you can see three months later, you have resolution of the disc bulge. The spinal cord is quite happy. Three months later, the only intervention was specific corrective exercise. No surgery, happy's Larry. Now this is your cervical spine, so another part of the body, but the same mechanisms can happen. You can see a nasty disc bulge here, compressing on the spinal cord. Short time later, a couple of months with conservative rehabilitation, there is resolution of the disc prolapse. Look at that, that's a very happy spinal cord. So what we're looking to do is to help you understand that the MRI scan is a valuable tool, but it's one of many things that we use to help in crafting your specific game plan. Now. As you saw, there is spectrum. So if you are far along, you have a chronic issue, it is quite serious, then it would help us in saying, look, I think you do need to see the big fella and get an opinion from an, a neurosurgeon or a appropriate professional um, to escalate your help. So uh, I really like living by spectrums there because um, the advice can, can help you regardless of where you are. Now, in terms of, of pain, as a general comment, please seek your GP for appropriate guidance on medications. Because as I said, being on a spectrum, everyone is in a different stage of the race. So normal analgesics like Panadol versus non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like Voltaren, Nurofen, Advil, they can play a role in mediating your pain in the short term. Then if you are finding significant inflammatory pain, a lot of aching at rest, night pain, um, your, your doctor may decide to increase your dose, dosage of anti-inflammatories. And they may start to table uh, stronger anti-inflammatories like prednisolone, which is a steroid. So if you think of the cortisone injection, prednisolone is the tablet version of that same injection. But again, this is a discussion with your doctor and they will also take into consideration your general health because there's uh, contraindications or problems if you have issues with your blood pressure or kidneys and steroids have significant side effects. So have that conversation. 
people that are heading towards the chronic end of the spectrum with your back pain, you may need more help with neuropathic or anti-anxiety uh, medications um, like Lyrica is, is a common one or NDEP. These may be medications you're currently on and you're being advised by your, your practitioner, which is great. These are things that can assist you in the short to medium term. In the long term, if you've been managing uh, back pain, particularly the referred sciatica pain, pain management is a service that may be indicated for you. And this is a... Um, this, this can be a significant service for you because when you're in pain all the time and it's at a threshold that is starting to change your biology, um, this pain management service has three specialists under the one roof to help you with your chronic pain behavior. You have a, 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 a pain specialist, a doctor. You have a pain psychologist to help you with the mental mechanisms of the pain. And you have your pain physiotherapist. Um, and there's a lot of great service providers around Melbourne. I tend to refer to advanced healthcare or brain pain and spine centers around Melbourne. So if you have any questions about that, if this speaks to you, please reach out and I can help refer you to appropriate services. As a general comment, these modalities would not be normally recommended as a first line treatment option, because as you come to learn, managing your load, understanding what your body is trying to tell you, and trying to avoid uh, medications for the long term, I think is a, a good standard of practice. So in conclusion, um, I'd like to say that conservative treatment is always the best option. Um, from there, once you've corrected movement patterns and you've managed your load, your tolerance has improved, you, know, you, you have so many options of where you'd like to go to next. If you found that you've exhausted your conservative measures, then we can help assist you with onward referral along in coordination with your doctor. Um, and it may mean speaking to other professionals with your goals. It may be a dietitian to help you with nutrition and weight loss. It may be with uh, a specialist and it may be onward to pain management. Um, I think developing your own specific goals for your lifestyle, for, your, for what makes you happy is really important. Okay, so what I'd like to do now before I finish up is go through two things I promised. I promised the world and I'd like to deliver on two exercises that you can do right now, which can help in your back pain. So just give me one second. How do I make this big screen? Okay. So if I go to speak of you. Good. Have, have you guys got me on the big screen there? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Yes. Now, what I'm going to do is go through the number one exercise I tend to give into the clinic, which again, if this gives you pain, um, please stop and make sure you, you seek some help. Now, I'm going to grab an elastic band here. Okay. And the key muscle that I like for a strong back is a strong backside. So if you start with a resistance band and you pop this band around the knees, nice and comfortable because you're in a sitting position, okay? What I'd like you to do is in the seated position with the last band is I want you to try and open one leg at a time out to the side and let it come back to the midline. And what this will specifically do is it will help strengthen your backside, your left hip. And if you've done, say, a set of 10 of these exercises on your left leg, try 10 on the other leg, and you will feel that around your hip pocket to your backside pocket. So this exercise, I encourage you to trial a three lots of 10, so three sets of 10 repetitions, one leg at a time, in the seated position, you're not weight bearing, so the back's generally pretty happy, but you should find as your hips get a lot stronger, it helps reduce the strain onto your lower back. Okay, now the two areas that I tend to support in terms of strengthening is your backside, which I've just gone through. The second one that I like is something called abdominal bracing. Um, and in the Pilates world, it's kind of when you're sucking your guts in, if those of you that are Pilates practitioners, and what I'd like you to do is in your, wherever you are at home, I'd like you to just sit 
with your hands just around your belly. So if you have your belly button and you're just going slightly ajar, while you're sitting, I'd like you to try and uh, pretend like someone's about to punch you in the stomach and you're tensing your tummy, you're tensing your guts, you're tightening up this abdominal wall. Okay, so when you're ready, I'd get you to just flop everything out and just relax. And then when you're ready, I'll get you to switch on and brace now, please. So brace, keep your breathing, and then relax. Perfect. Try it again. And I'd like you to brace and tell me if you feel, or just note if you feel any discomfort in your lower back. And then relax. And then when you're ready, try one more time. So fingers on the edge, bracing, keeping your breathing. Perfect. And then relax. Now, why this is an important skill is because if you learn this bracing technique, which engages these deep back brace muscles, you can apply this to any time throughout the day. So if you're making a pot of food and then you've got to lift that heavy pot across the stove, you can brace your tummy as you're helping that pot across the road. Okay, if you're, if you're playing with kids, you can brace your tummy to help action these back brace muscles. You can brace as you go to lift up the kids. And most importantly, as you're performing exercise, like this clam, the seated clam I've taught you, you can brace your tummy, maintain your breathing as you're strengthening your hips and you're getting a two for one here. You're strengthening your hips and you're strengthening your core and that allows more muscular support for your spine. Okay, I should charge you twice, two for one. So that bracing, that bracing effort sounds very innocent. It sounds very simple, but practically it is a plug and play um, strategy you can deploy anytime throughout the day. Brace when you're brushing your teeth. If you're walking outside with the dog, brace from one light post to the next light post. Get to the point where it's almost automatic. Yeah, yeah, Karina here said that uh, she felt that bracing in her pelvic floor. Because when you're bracing this trunk, you're creating a good strong foundation like a house. And what that does is it gives you leverage so that you can be a lot stronger in what you're lifting. That's the whole premise of Pilates and basically core strengthening work. Okay, so I've given you two gifts there, a strong backside, good for functional tasks. When you bend and lift, the power comes from your hips, good strong core or your trunk through this abdominal bracing. And I won't give you a dosage in terms of how many reps, how often. I would just challenge you to apply this regularly. If you can make it, uh, a point of order to engage your core every time you're in the kitchen because it involves a lot of repetitive bending, getting down to the dishwasher, picking up the rubbish. Okay, And if you can think about bracing or um, engaging that as you maintain your breathing, that is a big gold star from the physio because that's half the challenge that most people I find in the clinic struggle with, struggle with is uh, understanding what bracing is and applying it throughout the day. Okay, so... Another good cue, a couple of good cues, if you're, if you're struggling to, un, to misunderstand um, bracing, um, I'd like you to think about if you're busting to go to the loo and you're trying to hold your passageways in, okay? It's kind of like that tightening in, which is bridging onto the pelvic floor stuff, but that can help you with the tightening up that I'm talking about. My favorite example I use is, imagine you're at the beach and uh, you're there with all your friends, and then someone takes a photo of the team and then everyone hides their guts because you don't want to show <laughs> yeah. try, try that, okay? So the beach, going to the loo or just being punched in the gut, um, that's going to help you with bracing. All right, I've labored that point. I'm going to finish up with um, some resources. We follow a specific international method. It's called the McGill method from this friendly fellow with the, the gun mustache. Um, Professor Stuart McGill, he's a, um, he's a long-time researcher and physiotherapist in Ottawa, Canada. His method is implemented all around the world and our physios implement uh, his teachings. A local Australian um, physiotherapist and uh, has gone on further research, Dr. Andrew Locke, um, is also someone that we follow and implement his guidelines for low back pain. So um, yeah, that's where we, and he's uh, also lectured at Melbourne University. And just so you're aware, 
We um, are two physios at Newport. Uh, we're here Monday mornings, Wednesday all day, Friday all day. If you need a friendly face to help you, um, to help empower you to self-manage and live your, your best, happiest lives. So thank you for sitting through my presentation. I've got a few shout outs here. Thank you, Liz. And thank you, Karina. I'm happy to take some questions in a few minutes that we have left. Thank you, guys. Um, feel free to pop your questions in the chat. Or if you have um, any questions, feel free to unmute and um, we'll have a bit of a chat. Okay, first question here. Would you ever recommend back and shoulder adjustable braces? Um, let me just double check. Laurie, so thank you, Laurie. Would you ever recommend back and shoulder adjustable braces um, or would you primarily recommend exercises to self-manage? Yeah, so if we just use braces as a general comment, um, we would look at them as passive uh, assistive tools, okay? So I think primarily if you can get yourself to a point where um, you are strong enough and you can go without um, braces or postural supports, that's the best game plan. If you've done the best that you can to self-manage, improve your strength, improve your tolerance, and you're still struggling, at that point, I would recommend a brace for a period of time. I hope that helps you, Laurie. So we always want you to have your parts and pieces that mum and dad gave you, so you keep yourself resilient. Okay, thank you for that. A lot of thank yous. Appreciate that, Tony. Love your work. <laughs> Thanks, Kerry. Yep, we'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Guys, I really hope you enjoyed that presentation. I did think about the best way to present this information because I think with the scientific -y stuff, it can sometimes be onerous. Um, I like this idea that we can apply a principle of spectrums and you determine where you are and make goals for where you want to be. Okay, sounds philosophical, but that's how I can see us helping you across the whole board, regardless if you're a youngie, an oldie, if you're energetic or if you're running on flat batteries, I think that's important. Okay, thank you, Dewey. I appreciate that. Yep, the elements of your back pain. Thank you, Susie. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Matthew. Okay, another question here from Sue. I get lower back soreness after vacuuming and gardening, which settles down overnight. Friends suggest physio-led Pilates classes, but it's expensive. Look, I, I appreciate that. Yes, um, I think getting the specific care and a small one to three, one to four exercise program is very different to a group training where you're thrown in with 20 other people and it's a bit cheaper. So in a Pilates class, which we don't offer here at this location, but um, I actually think it's worthwhile because at least you get a little bit more guidance. My only concern is it's still not as um, specific to your needs one-to-one. -one. So if you've met with a physio or your provider and you've got the advice that makes sense to you, then you should start to see things like vacuuming, gardening, settling down. Now, based off that, what you've just said, vacuuming, gardening, I would suggest that you start with what I've recommended. Think about building in your bracing, build up your backside, and you will find that those things will get less and less over time. But I always recommend getting your specific um, situation reviewed um, with, a, with, a, with a physio. Uh, yes, thank you, Susie. Um, yes, I am at Newport, but um, at our website here, I'll just make sure. So along with Dr. Andrew Locke, if you jump onto our uh, ProPhysio website, so prophysioplus.com, .au, that's the guy up there. Um, you'll find that we're across different locations in Melbourne, um, but we have a lot of great information on our blog. So we've got, yep, that's me over there looking a bit funny. We've got like short videos on back pain plus other things that may um, interest you. And we have it in a way that uh, is easy to read. So not too onerous. Thank you. A couple more questions. Thank you, Genevieve. Okay, Chris, good question. Where can I purchase a band like the one you used in sitting? Yes. Get them from Rebel Sport. They're pretty inexpensive, 5 to $10 maximum, and you get a quite a range of colors. The lighter the color of the resistance band, the, the, the less resistance. So the, the blue one here is pretty heavy, and black is the hard. So if you're starting out and your conditioning is a bit low, start with a pink or a yellow. 
Thank you, Laurie, for your feedback. Thanks, boss. Thanks, Liz. Appreciate that. Okay, um, Chris asks, do you need a doctor referral to see a physio? Two things there. Um, no, you don't need to see a physio. You can go and see them privately. So walk off the street into a clinic, away you go, no problems. There are some great programs you can qualify for. So if you're a DVA card holder, um, you may be white card or gold card. Um, you can see your physiotherapist and depending on your physio provider, we don't charge on top of the schedule of fees. So there's no gap payment. Um, so DVA, Department of Veteran Affairs is a good one. Second one is through Medicare. You have up to five visits within a calendar year, um, which is organized by your medical center via your doctor. Uh, and then usually the practice nurse puts the paperwork together and then you can go and see your physiotherapist um, for those five free taxpayer funded visits. Now, again, depending on the location that you go um, here, Pro Physio Plus, we don't charge on top of, there's no out-of-pocket cost. So there's no gap fees if you choose to come and see us. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Okay, so I'll take this last question from Makara. Thanks for your patience, guys. She asks, What's your thoughts on wearing a belt to support your back while healing? This is, um, okay, in the McGill method of treatment, which was the back portion of my presentation today, the primary movement pattern, the, the primary goal is to normalize your movement pattern. Now, you may find that you will be like bent over and stooped when your back pain is very sore. Because as the disc is bulging backwards, as I've explained, if you extend and straighten up, it compresses on that disc and that fires off the pain. Long term, that's short term. Long term, you don't want to be hunched over. You want to normalize and be nice and, and functional. Alternatively, you may find that your disc pain forces you to lean like the leaning town of Pisa Pisa, Tower of Pisa, to one side more so than the other. So if we have you in a supportive brace when the disc is still very spicy, it's still very upset, it will actually slow down your healing process. So I would say 80% of the time we just dis not discourage, but we encourage that you allow the movement patterns to normalize. And then at that point when we've helped guide you to what we feel is the best that you can manage at that time, we can make a decision on whether supportive braces are needed to just help get you over the hurdle. But as a starting point, I would say no. Try and help with appropriate advice and guidance to improve on your movement patterns and get back to, to the happy you. Okay, I hope that answers your question. Guys, I, I have got a lot of great feedback for this presentation. I was really worried because I thought it might be a bit too hocus pocus, like it didn't make sense. But I'm glad you guys um, saw the benefit in just understanding that your, your, your pain is a real thing. It sits somewhere within where you are in your time in life. And regardless of where you are, physio can help you with your back pain. And if you choose us, we'd love to help you with your, pro, uh, with your progress and get you back up and about. All right, I've enjoyed this uh, session today. Thank you for your time. Um, watch out for the recording. And if you need any help, reach out. All right. Thank you very Thank much. You Thank you. Thank you.